Good afternoon to everyone. Susan and I are glad you are with us this afternoon for So What Do I Do Now? Helping Students Address Challenges in Social Studies. On behalf of Susan and myself, we'd like to welcome you to this webinar. As we look forward to not only the most missed items on the 2014 GED test in social studies, but as we discuss some strategies for digging just a little bit deeper. As we get started today, um, you should have received from us both a PowerPoint and a webinar guide with all kinds of activities, etc., that we will be referencing this afternoon. So, Susan, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Bonnie, and good afternoon, everybody who's here. We're really glad that you're going to spend some time with us. And so let's take a look at exactly what it is that we're going to do today. First of all, we're going to go in and we're going to take a look at the social studies, those most missed items. And we've done a little bit of this, but we're going to dig a little bit deeper as we're going through. The other thing is we're going to identify some strategies and activities that we really hope will help students overcome some of the challenges that they're having in social studies. And you know it wouldn't be a webinar if Bonnie and I didn't share a few uh, online resources for you so you can take those back in and use them in the classroom, share them with students as you're moving through. So let's kind of get a little bit of a feel for where are we when it comes to social studies. And we're going to do that by taking a look at where that passing percentage is sitting for Florida. And notice that, well, down in the cellar we have math, but right behind that we have social studies. Students seem to be having some difficulty in that passing percentage and getting that passing score that they need. But if you take a look over there at the side where it says average non-passing score, well, we don't have far to go. We don't need a ton of questions answered. It's not like that they're really scoring in the 120s or 130s. Their 143 on social studies is that average. So let's see what we can do as we work through here for the next um, 55 minutes or so. And let's see what we can do in, in order to help students boost that score and get over that passing mark. Now, just a reminder, um, because we've talked about these before, but let's kind of put things into perspective as we're going through. You know we have three different performance levels for GED. That performance level one, now those are those students that we're really concerned about, and especially that group that sits from 140 up to 149. We want to kick them over into the 150 range so that they can earn that high school equivalency. But, you know, we like to be overachievers in Florida, so if we can work through and look at performance level three, how about getting students' GED score with honors, that 170 and above? And, you know, with some work and a little strategizing and a little crossing content areas, we should be able to do some of those things. Now, if you haven't already pulled down those PLDs, or as Bonnie and I like to call them, the stuff to teach, you need to do that, especially with the social studies. And then uh, next week we're going to be talking about science because there are a couple things you can do with it. Based on that student coming out of taking GED Ready, you can look at, well, where's the student right now? And Maybe I need to wait a little bit before the student goes to test because they still have a few areas they need to work with. They also can help us in terms of shaping what those learning activities are going to be. So how can we engage students, get them into those reasoning and those problem solving skills, and give us a little perspective when it comes to lesson plans, especially when we start talking about looking at what we call that content-rich nonfiction as we're moving through. So having said that, kind of refreshed, reviewed, let's talk a little bit about what challenges we're having when it comes to social studies. Now, Bonnie and I have talked about this, and we've talked extensively and talked to GED testing service and teachers, and we're saying, you know, our students really shouldn't be having problems with 
understanding specific details and main ideas. I mean, those are some real basics that we teach when we're doing just reading comprehension. But we have to think of this a little differently. Now we're talking about working with nonfiction text, and we have that rigor rigorous word in there, more rigorous text that students are having to do. And so we have to work with them to say, all right, you're able to do this at this lower level, but let's see if we can't build those skills over time. And there's a series of things that we can do in helping students move through that process. Well, that's one area. But let's look at another one. Here we've got this one, and it's analyzing relationships within written sources. This is an area where our students have struggled for a long time because they're used to looking at text in a more cursory manner. In fact, many times our students will want to just scan or scan and find an answer. And instead, what we've got to do is have that student begin to read more closely, look at not just what they think, but what that author's trying to tell them, what's the purpose behind what they're having to read. And they have to also be able to go through and look at it from a standpoint of, if I have to find evidence, is that evidence accurate and is it sufficient to make my argument, especially when I get over there and I'm doing my extended response. So those are areas that we have not spent a lot of time in the past working on, and so we're going to have to kind of up the ante in that particular area. But what really complicates things is the fact that we have to do that looking at primary sources. And so we have this really nice graphic for you, and you can see we've got a whole bunch of different things here because we have to think about what are primary sources. Well, first of all, those are like the first person accounts that was created at the time that event occurred. And in fact, we're going to work with a primary source in just a little bit. So you've got everything from oral records. We could have students who are listening to audio versions of things. Um, you have visual artifacts. You know, it doesn't have to be narrative to be a primary source. And then you have things that researchers use. That's that census data that gets out and collected in historical maps. And then we have those secondary sources. So our students seem to be okay when it comes to that secondary source because they're generally a little easier to read. The analysis has been done, but it's working with those primary sources that really is a difficulty for our, most of our students as they're going through. So let's take a look at one more item here. Well, actually, we're going to look at two, but we're going to look at this one. Can we determine clearly stated details? in a primary and secondary source. OK, that's easy enough. It's, it's, it's right there. So I should be able to find it in the text. But now can I use that information to make logical inferences and valid claims? So I don't just find things. I've got to put them to use. And we know that we've had a lot of trouble with our students over the years in being able to make that uh, a, that whole leap into inferences as they're moving through. So one more area, and I have to tell you, I absolutely love this cartoon that we found in order to include here. Because our students are going to have to describe people, places, environments, processes, events, and how those things connect. And many of you probably heard of making text connections. Well, I love this cartoon, text to text, text to self, text to the world. Leave it to school to take the fun out of texting. It's something that can get our students' attention. And you know, in fact, Bonnie and I had someone in a workshop just the other day who said, you know, we're talking a lot about text when we talk with students now. And they're having this vision of something that you do with your thumbs when we're talking about passages. And so even the words themselves can sometimes present problems 
for our students in understanding well, exactly what is it that you want me to do. So, Bonnie, how about taking over and I'll let you talk a little bit about one more little issue and how to start building those reading skills. You know, Susan, as you were talking about that, you are so correct about us needing to use the words that we're seeing in today's GED test, as well as the words we're using in education, not only text, but the other word I think was sight. I mean, are we talking a website? Are we talking the fact that I can see sight? Or are we talking sight evidence? Can you state it out there? So the other area that our students are having difficulty with is cause and effect. Again, something that we have been teaching for a long time. However, the difference is that sometimes cause and effect relationships aren't one cause and one effect, but rather there can be multiple factors where there are multiple causes or multiple effects or both. And that really comes down to the aspect of whether our students know those clue words. Do they know those words that are going to highlight for them, aha, this is a cause or this is an effect. Things which, again, we just need to be looking at our lessons and saying, am I digging deeper in those areas? Am I teaching to the level? that students will need to be successful not only on the GED test, but as they head out for post-secondary education and the workplace. For those of you who are saying, but gosh, I don't remember getting the PowerPoint or the workbook that you're talking about, just realize that there was a link to access those documents, and it's also going to be available on the Florida IPDE website, so you will have both of them. But having said that, as we look at some of the most missed questions, the most missed areas, many of them seem to be dealing with reading. You know, those complex reading strategies that we need. And when we look at the strategy, strategies that students may or may not have, it really is about digging deeper and not only teaching those strategies once or twice, but teaching those strategies on an ongoing basis so that as students are reading complex texts, they have a menu of strategies that they use on an ongoing basis in an automatic way. The fact that they are previewing themselves and they're activating that prior knowledge, but also all of those things that you and I do as we read complex texts, which oftentimes I'll be the first to say my students never did. They didn't always self-question. They didn't summarize as they were chunking materials. Heaven forbid that I would ask them to take notes or use a graphic organizer. Probably out of this list, one of the things that they did do a lot of was to highlight or underline. The problem was the a lot. It seemed like they highlighted or underlined everything, which again did not help with building that, those comprehension skills. So if you've been with Susan and me in workshops, you know that we strongly believe that effective reading strategies really are at the base, whether it's RLA, social studies, science, or of course math. And so we need to make sure that our students have those strategies and that they're able to use them just very effectively on an ongoing basis. One of the things that we all know work really well is that our students need to have effective reading rate. Without that, comprehension skills, ex oh gosh, they just suffer. Because if I read too slowly, I forgot what I said at the beginning or forgot what I read at the beginning, and so comprehension is nil. And yet in all the workshops that Susan and I have done with fellow educators, it is one of the things they keep saying to us, but you know what? My students may only read 60 words or 100 words a moment, a minute with comprehension. And we're going to say to you that's way too slow for comprehension to occur. That's at the level of decoding. And so as we look at different resources that are out there for us, and so many of them are free, we have a number of things that will help us get students to read more effectively through a better reading rate 
and again helping them break poor reading habits. Susan found a great site at Mind Bluff, and if you can click into your guide, your handy dandy guide, or what I will do is pull up the workbook, the guide as we're talking about, it should look something like this. And as you're in that guide, you'll notice that the first page you have the information that Susan just went over, those missed, most missed items. You even have a larger copy of that lovely graphic. But this is the one thing that we're going to take just a few moments to look at because we're going to build some strategies based upon this short article about the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you've got your guide and it's easier for you to read from your guide, please do so. Otherwise, we're going to give you just a minute or so to take a look at this article and then let's talk about how can we use one short piece of nonfiction text to not only build reading rate, but to also get into some of those other skills that our students are having difficulty with. So having said that, Susan, I'm going to hush for just a moment and let folks read. It is a two-page document, so I'll give you about 90 seconds on this page and just a couple seconds on the next page. And I'm going to turn the page. For those of you who finish long before I turn the page, You'll notice that this is written at approximately an 8.0, that's quantitative, and you'll see that it has about 417 words. So I would expect students to truly be able to read this in under two minutes and to read it with comprehension skills. Susan, what do you think? Is that kind of where I should be with this? Well, exactly. That's where we should be because as we're taking a look at these things, what we have to realize is that on average, our students who are at that secondary level, and let's, let's take them like 8.9 on above, that they should comfortably be reading on average between 250 and 300 words. And that's just when they're not trying to, you know, I mean, when, you, when you're trying to closely read something and you're studying, you're going to slow down a little bit, but you're not going to come far off that mark. The problem that we have is that our students are way below that mark. In fact, they are falling, as Bonnie said, somewhere between the 60, 80, 100 word range, and as a result, they're having real difficulty in doing those very things that we were talking about before, which is finding that central idea, understanding how things are connected. All of those things are difficult when you are reading basically word by word. And that's what many of our students do. So there are a couple things that what we want you to think about is how you can help students break there's a few bad habits that they have out there. First is to avoid that sub-vocalization. You know how students are reading and their lips are moving? What happens is that automatically slows them down. Because we know there's a difference between a reading rate and reading fluency rate because they're two different things. One is done silently, one is read aloud, and the, when you do fluency, it's a little slower. So in order to improve that, we have to get them to 
stop saying the words out loud. But also, we have to make sure they begin to expand what we call their eye span. It should be at least one and a half inches in length. And that's generally about four to five words, which is how we read as effective readers. We pick up and we look at about that many words each time. So we want to expand the student's eye span. We also want to make sure that we're helping students avoid those skip backs. And what happens when they are reading so slowly is that they get a little bit down a paragraph and their eyes pop back up and they start all over again. So they're constantly reading and rereading material and it gets all confused. And we have to get them to focus. This is not the time when you multitask and you've got the iPhone going on one side and you've got a lot of other things. It's about focus and it's also about practice. Practice, practice, practice. And we've given you the article on the Pledge of Allegiance that is from a website that we've talked about in the past called Marshall Adult Education. And what they've done is they have put together a wide range of stories, all the way from about a 0.7 grade equivalent up to 8.9. And along with that, they include questions, such as you see on this slide, and also some vocabulary. So it's got a nice little package, and you, the good part is you don't have to buy anything. But your students can use this to really begin moving through the process. Now, <clears throat> we would want to expand beyond the questions that they ask, but it gives us a nice starting point as we're working through the process. And if you, know you what? take a I'm look on that second page, can you pull back over, Bonnie, to the other page for us, um, to the other document real quick. There you go. What we've tried to include here for you are some different types of questions because we've talked before about how important it is to have text-dependent questions, meaning I have to have read the text, and also those text independent questions, which can often go more into opinions, but also allow students to explore a topic a little bit more. And so those are things that you need to keep in mind. But I think Bonnie's got the perfect way to deal with the vocabulary of a piece and how we can make sure that students don't just read the words and pronounce them, but that they really know what they mean and what they've learned from what they read. So, Bonnie. When we look at teaching any type of social studies content, it really is also about the reading process. There's no way to get around it. So you can really look at it, invert it, just the other way. We're really teaching strong reading processes through nonfiction where they'll also learn content. And we all know that vocabulary is a really important part of comprehension. But we also know that research tells us that the very worst way to teach vocabulary is here's the definition, test on Friday. Instead, students need to own words. And so uh, one effective way is to use what they call a narrative chain. And a narrative chain is simply that I look at what I'm going to be teaching my students. Does it matter whether it's an article such as you just read on the Pledge of Allegiance or it may be the First Amendment? But I look at the words that I really want my students to understand. And as I'm teaching the lesson, I use those words. And I have students use those words. And then as an assessment tool, I use a narrative chain to see whether they really understand. So when I look at that short article, I see the words recite, pledge, indivisible. Those are words that I want students to own. And so I say to them, just show me that you own those words. I need you to use those words in a short paragraph. Now, some of my students try to put in a sentence, and I'll tell you, it didn't always work but a short paragraph. And the only rule I ever put in 
was, you may not use the following sentence. My vocabulary words for this week were, but if they come up with something like the following. The Pledge of Allegiance is routinely recited at the beginning of a special meeting of the school day. The Pledge of Allegiance reminds us that we are one nation that cannot be divided. It also emphasizes the importance of being loyal to our country. While there have been different versions, each emphasizes the importance of understanding that liberty and justice are promised to all of us. You know, all of a sudden, I know that my students know those words. They own those words. And if I have the students read their writing samples, not only do I know they own those words, or if they don't, what I need to reiterate as I reteach some things, as they listen to each other's writing samples, that information goes from short-term to hopefully long-term memories. So narrative chains, regardless of the level of nonfiction text that students oh. are reading. But Bonnie, I have a question for you. Sure. You didn't use the word indivisible. I didn't, did I? But you hmm. used the word divided and you said cannot be divided. So is that okay if a student knows what they mean but they use a different form of the word? Well, I think you'll notice that I didn't use loyalty either. I used loyal. There again, any type of version of the word also works. If I add prefixes and suffixes or remove them, fantastic, because there again, vocabulary is built by adding prefixes, suffixes, and of course by deleting them down to the root word. So I'm real pleased when my students are able to do that. So that's something, folks, that you want to keep in mind as you're going through. It's not about always having the student just do that, recite that word back. It's about showing that they understood that indivisible meant cannot be divided. And that's something that we want our students to be able to do, is to go to that level with it as we're working through. So as we move on to the next part, Again, we've got this little chart, and you have a copy of it in your, in your workbook itself, but primary sources. So let's talk briefly about how, as instructors, we need to approach primary sources. And the process for doing that is called four reads. In other words, we have to read a primary source four different times because we're looking at different pieces. Now, if you take a look at the chart, and the chart is also included in your workbook on page 5, you'll see that we're reading first, not the entire document, but just parts of it. We want the top, because we really want to get the title and the author, but even more than that, with the primary source, we want to know where and when, because that's going to set the stage for us as we're moving through. Likewise, we can move down to the bottom of the text and we can say, okay, let's look at the notes or the bibliography. Is there something there that's going to kind of key in for me, that's going to activate some background knowledge that I may have or at least get me thinking? I'm not worried in that first read about the main body. That's for me to do as I go to the second one. And in that second read, I'm reading through the main body, but I'm looking for the central idea. What is this author trying to tell me? What does this author want me to know about the purpose of this? Now, here's the part that tends to be difficult for many of our students. They read through a text and they get to something that's hard and they maybe have a few words they don't understand. Rather than just skipping that and continuing on, and you know, you might actually get the definition just a little bit further down the page, they tend to go back and do that reread thing and start again. So what we want students to do is to realize it's okay sometimes if you need to skip something because you may be able to get it from the context of the stuff that you read further. So we have them underline that sentence or phrase that really gets to the heart of what that author was trying to tell them. So that's read two. 
read three is to actually go back through the document one more time and look at it from a standpoint of, okay, I know the central idea, but now I'm looking for what supports that. What's the evidence? What are the assertions? Are they logical? Is there a contradiction in what's being said? So that's my second read. Then my fourth read, and generally what happens is people begin to kind of do this along with their third as they're working through, is that I want to read like a historian. I actually want to go in there and I want to question things. I want to say, okay, does something about the date and the place or the author's viewpoint, does that bias what's being said as they're moving through? Does it impact the argument? That's where I'm doing my critical thinking. I'm reasoning through that document and I'm questioning it. And that's what we want our students to do. Next week when we talk about science, we're going to talk about reading like a scientist and how you do those same kinds of things as you're working through. So I know what your students are going to say. Too much time, too much time, I can't do this, I don't have enough time. Actually, they don't have enough time not to do it, especially when they're going to be doing an extended response or you're going to be working in more complex text. Susan, I have something to say on that. Okay. Because you did such a great job on four reads for primary sources, I've decided mm -hmm. not to put it into science next week. <laughs> so, you know, because quite honestly, there's so many things we can do, and I think that's what's important for us to understand is, as teachers is many of the ways that I teach reading for social studies, I use those same things in science because in science, yes, you're right, I'm going to do a first read, a second read. Maybe my third read, it's not so much a read for argument, is it is a read for support. You know, does, mm -hmm. is there support for the central idea? And reading like a scientist, again, it's just really a great way to read, whether it's the primary sources in social studies or the primary sources in science. Good readers are good readers. Well, and the thing about it as we go on and we look is that what we're trying to get across to students is the importance of being able to closely read the material True. that they have. Because that's the bottom line. If I can closely read and question as I'm going through, I gain better understanding of any text that I'm going to read. And what that is going to do as we move on to that next slide is it's really going to let us understand how important those reading skills are as we move through. And then we'll move on to one more and we're actually going to talk about making connections. And there are a number of different things that are happening as we're making connections. Remember that little thing about taking all the fun out of text? Well, what we want to do is help our students make connections upon the different things that are going on in a text. Sometimes we want them to come back and say, you know, oh, this reminds me of, or maybe it's like, oh, I think I read something like that, or I heard something on TV. Those are all things that are going to help that student better understand what it is that they're reading. For example, as you take a look, text itself, has something like this ever happened to me? And how does this relate? Or if we go text to text, how's this different from other books I've read? Or how's this different from the other article? Maybe I had two articles, one taking the pro side, one taking the con. How is this different? How is it similar? And then also add into that broader world, because we want our students to understand how things are connected, especially when we talk about primary sources, because a lot of times people say, oh, that happened a long time ago. I don't need to worry about that. That's over and done with. Well, that saying that history repeats itself is very true as we're moving through. So we want to be able to work with those text connections. And then there's a way that we can work with this, especially if we have some struggling readers. And this is a thing called stop and chat. 
what we often fail to do is to break up text into small enough pieces that our students can really grasp at that close reading level what it's talking about. So stop and chat, very simple. You have pre-designated spots that you want students to stop reading. And at that point, you have questions and time for them to talk about maybe it's a paragraph, maybe it's two or three paragraphs, and you're going to discuss it. But it gives them a chance to go through and talk. And remember, we've, Bonnie and I have said this many times, you don't learn critical thinking or reasoning from a book. You learn that by having conversations and interacting with people. So we've got some generic prompts that we've included here, like, what's this section of the text about? What was the author's point in this section? And getting again to that central idea. What's the central idea that's occurring there? And then last but not least, we want to make sure that we take care of that text-independent, text-dependent question thing that's out there. Because too many of our materials go for the text-independent rather than the text-dependent. And just keep in mind that those text-independent often don't require that the student read anything. They're often opinion, and they really take students away from the central idea. We want them to have to delve into the text itself, so we want to be really cautious with this. So let's talk a little, just a little bit more as we're getting wrapping up for today. How do I put all this stuff to work? Well, it just so happens that Bonnie and I thought long and hard about, okay, what can we do in terms of a primary source that would have some kind of connection that students could make. And believe it or not, if you take a look at Franklin D. Roosevelt's first inaugural address, which was in 1933, and you that was have a long it, time ago. Yes, it was a long time ago. Um, and that's on page nine in your workbook. You will see that this particular text actually does have the ability to make a lot, you have a lot of ability to make connections within it. And this is the type of thing that our students need to read. What we did is we pulled an excerpt for you so that you can use this particular one. And if you were going to do stop and chat, I would probably take about half of the first paragraph, stop, move into the other half, stop and chat, and then I could take those other paragraphs as I go through. You mean something like this? This helped me in that possibility. Mm -hmm. You know, as soon as I saw this, I thought, ah, that last phrase. I didn't think that last phrase was from this speech. I thought it was from another speech because I remember when GED testing service, when we were at a workshop with them once and they said this new test, all of us in the field have nothing to fear but fear itself. And I really thought that was I don't know what speech I thought it was, but I didn't realize it was his first inaugural address. Ah, but see how you've made a connection. You've done a self-detect connection in all this, and that's what we want our students to be able to ah, do. So that makes sense. As we go through, you see how we've broken it apart into different pieces, and we ask questions. And in this particular part. What's the author trying to tell us about his speech? Well, what we want our students to realize is that he's trying to tell them that he's going to tell the truth. And it may be a little difficult because sometimes we want to kind of shrink away from honestly facing things. But this is how he's going to lay it on the line of what's going on in 1933 and where the country is at that point. And if we stop and think about it, there's a connection students could make. Have you ever had a situation like that where you knew you needed to say something, but uh, you really didn't want to? 
it's those texts to self to begin to relate to what they're doing. And then, of course, Bonnie comes into the next one is have to fear is fear itself. What message is that giving the audience about the future of the country? Those are all things where we can break this apart. So as we take a look at the next slide, we can go through and take a look at it from a standpoint of this is how we need to work with students. After they read, what kind of personal connections can they make? Can they connect it to something they've already read or they've read, you know, read in the past? Is there any world, kind of world connection, something that's going on out there I can relate it to? So as Bonnie and I were talking through this particular text, what we did is we said, okay, let's take some pieces and let's think about how that might work with our students. And so and on the chart... And yes, Susan, before you go on, one of the questions, and I think it's a good one from the field, says, is it true on the GED test that students need to be able to make that connection? In other words, it's not always laid out there. And you're so correct. Students need to make connections because oftentimes the answers aren't right there. They need to infer, they need to bring in some, and I did say some background knowledge, so there again they can make those connections. That's why it really is so important that we take less items, but dig deeper so that that information can be gleaned. So good question. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's what makes the difference here in this test. This is the difference between having something that's just, you know, oh, go and find the answer in this particular paragraph. This is about thinking through what you're reading. Well, Bonnie just mentioned all we have to fear is fear itself. But if I were a student in the classroom, it might be a time that I had to speak in class and, you know, I was so afraid. And then it wasn't as bad as I thought. My fear was keeping me from doing something that I was going to benefit from. Or if you take a look at another quote from this, values have shrunken to fantastic levels. Taxes have risen. Our ability to pay has fallen. Hmm. Anybody read any articles about tax increases? Or maybe people having a hard time paying those taxes are people losing their homes. That's something that's very much been in, you know, out there on TV. It's been in the newspapers and magazines since 2008, 2009. So students can relate. Again, we're making a connection. And then that last one, an equally great number toil with little return. Well, there's been quite a bit of conversation on TV, on the web, um, podcasts, any number of things about people who work in low and fast food restaurants protesting the low wages they have and asking for more than the minimum wage. So again, here's a speech from 1933. It's 2014. And yet we have many of the very same connections that we can make. And that's what's going to make the difference for our students. Now, one so, more thing. I was going to say, so as I read, what I'm hearing you say is, first of all, as the educator, I need to take these primor primary sources, and we're going to chunk them. And we're going to ask some basic questions that help students then connect to themselves, to the text, and to the world? Absolutely. So then try. my next, OK. So you're going to try sense. each time to make those. Because think about it. How much easier is it for you, when you go to read something, if you activate your own background knowledge? OK. That makes sense. So then I can tie it all together, so to speak, at the mm -hmm. end by then developing a few questions that will assess, again, whether my students have really read and understood. And 
I think I'm not going to ask text independent questions, although that may be a good thing to get started with to set the stage. It's sure not going to show me whether my students have read that article or not. So what I'm hearing you say is I need text dependent questions. Absolutely, because I can ask you, have you ever been afraid, but that's not going to connect to all we have to fear is fear itself until we get and dive into the text itself. So, but okay. to look at these, now we're looking very specifically at something where we have to explain a quote or we have to explain other things as we're moving through. And very definitely in order to understand that, we have to read the text. I like these questions and they would not be that difficult to answer if my students had read the text. But boy, that last one looks a little more difficult. How? One of those how questions. A little more critical thinking, you would believe? Absolutely, but you know, there is a mention within there that he has made about the fact of how hard the founders of the country, I mean, they had to go to war against the greatest nation on earth at that time. And so the challenges of 1933 were, were small in comparison to the founding of a country. So we have lots of different things that we can work with. And again, what do we want? We want students to dive deeper in the text. We want them to think. We want them to make connections and then be able to express that. Well, then, you know, of course, we've heard all the time about evidence-based writing. So I guess I can just write then an evidence-based prompt to kind of finish it up with my students. Um, this one looks pretty good. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the beauty of the GED prompts at this point is that with just a little work, we can mirror those. Um, we're not, in this case, going through and, and doing a pro-con that they may have seen in different areas, but we are asking for evidence, not opinion, but evidence from the text that outlines those difficulties that were faced in 1933. You know what, I could even add to that, make it just a little deeper, if I ask students to include their own background knowledge of another time when the U.S. faced similar difficulties? Oh, tricky, tricky, tricky. Here we are moving on up and making sure that what are they doing? They're hitting all the elements that you're going to need when they get in there to do that final writing piece on that extended response. Good job. Thank you. If you've gathered, what we've talked about today is the fact that it's not about teaching a specific primary source, but identifying a quality primary source. Susan selected a speech today and working through the process of reading closely and writing about what you've read because none of us know exactly what kinds of articles or which primary sources will be selected for the GED test. And we keep saying it isn't just about a test. We want students to be able to closely read and write about what they read in all venues. And so the process or the strategies that we use should be the same regardless. And when we select a primary source to use, more the better if we can select something that will also bring in some historical background. This one, again, we can talk about different world conflicts. We can talk about economics. We can talk about so many things dealing with social studies. So that's the primary um, rationale for what we select. Uh, if you've been with us in social studies and science workshops before, you note that we've used different types of primary sources. Again, it comes back to making sure those strategies for close reading are automatic and being able to have students address different levels of text-based questions, including, of course, writing prompts. So, And one I, more thing in this, if you really wanted to, because we're fortunate enough to have many audio archives 
of Roosevelt and many of the different speeches that he did. And so you could even go out to the National Archives and pull an audio version of this so students could hear it and then follow the text of the speech itself. So, I mean, it just gives a different flavor to students. And again, we're bringing in different modalities that are going to make a difference for our students as we're working through. So just an idea to think if you have that, that capability within your classroom. And that sounds like then I could have different levels of students in my classroom and be able to use the same primary source, but differentiate by having some students listen to it or have it read to them, and having some of them delving deeper and reading it on their own. Well, I think that's pretty much, Bonnie, the only way we're going to be able to attack this, is that we have students who, both in social studies and science, have tremendous gaps in knowledge. And they don't have an understanding in how all these different pieces are connected. So why not work with the entire group? and just differentiate out the products, or in the case of this, where you have someone listening to the audio versus another one reading independently. It's going to be a big time saver all the way around. Let's take folks uh, just through the guide a little bit and then open it up for a few questions, OK? OK, sounds good. Um, just so that you're aware, because uh, most of you have been following along as we go through, but if you take a look on page 6 in the guide, you see where we have the option of looking at making text connections. And then over onto page 7, those different types of ways that we connect text and questions that you can ask. This is really about kind of getting a mindset and how to guide students in this process and modeling it for them so that as they move forward, they're going to be able to do this independently. Um, you have the text from uh, the excerpt from FDR speech. Another thing people recommend is that you can often use a double entry journal. That's on page 10 where a student will pull a key event, an idea, a word, or so on, and then they explain what it means in that double entry. Text-dependent questions, I know Bonnie and I keep harping on this, but it is so important because this is the part where we get students to read closely and they begin to put those pieces together. So there's information on page 11, and then you have a seven-step guide to how to put those text-dependent questions together for that close analytic reading. And, hey, it wouldn't be a workbook if we didn't have a checklist somewhere. So page 14 and 15 is a checklist for evaluating question quality. Um, you know, we need to make sure we're not just asking any old question, that we're asking quality questions. And then last but not least, on pages 16 and 17, um, and even a little bit on 18, there are a number of different resources here for social studies. We know that you can't cover everything that you would see in four years of social studies within a high school program. But what we've tried to do is, is find things that will be helpful to you in the classroom and will be of interest to students. So take uh, time to go through and explore some of these. Um, we just give you fair warning on some of them. Don't get in there late at night, because just like with Daryl Cagle's professional cartoonist, you'll be there for a long time. Or over in history world, there's a brain teasers part in there that is just this huge site. And um, I can get lost in it forever. So keep in mind all of those different things. And last but not least, it comes down to you. You have to model, you have to explain, and you have to guide. That's how students are going to start this process, is by watching and listening to what you do. From there, you're going to move them into being more and more independent. And that's what we want our students to do, is to be able to do this on their own. But we have to give them the skills to start with. And can't say it enough, high expectations. If you expect low, you get low. You expect high, your students will do that. And you'll follow through from there. And of course, we want to make sure that you don't forget the fact that we will next week, 
same time, same place, do a short webinar on the strategies for science. But in the meantime, don't forget that we do have the Florida IP Day website. And where there are lesson plans out there, there are grab and goes. Uh, there are all kinds of new materials that are going to be coming forth as we go forward. And so I believe we'll have 20 more lesson plans that are going to be added. It's your professional development website, so as you look at it, make sure if there's things that need to be added to assist you in the classroom that you let uh, June Rawl know at Florida IP Day, because again, that is why that site is there. A couple things, um, just as I see the question, Susan, and a couple things I am not sure of. Maybe you know, or they may need to go to someone else. How many LCPs are earned when a student passes a GED? Oh, I think that is a, uh, a Florida DOE Zelda question. Yes, um, and I believe I Zelda I, is I, on. So, <laughs> but again, we're not going to touch that. But if you ask us curriculum <laughs> questions, we'll be glad to answer. Um, and I would, what I would recommend is taking a look out there on the, because they do have the, the benchmarks, the standards yes. for, for GED, and so that would be a good resource for you. But we'll make sure we pass that question on to Zelda and, and get that answered for you. Okay, other questions. We're open to the audience for a couple minutes. If you do have questions, please uh, type them in or put them in the chat. While we're waiting to see if we have any questions pop in, just a couple of um, other reminders. Uh, if you haven't signed up for the newsletter in session from the GD testing service, you're going to want to do that. Um, that's how so many people found out about See It for Free. Um, when uh, they they did the free uh, GED Ready, uh, they've been providing a lot of other information. So if you haven't popped into that, please make sure that you do so. And one other question, where can I get a copy of the guide? There is a link to access both the um, PowerPoint and the guide. However, the PowerPoint and the guide are both going to be on the Florida IP Day website where the uh, webinar will be archived, so you'll be able to download them from there. Please note that anything that we do put there, please use if there are things you say, oh, this will work really well for me. I just need to change this or this out to work best. Please do so. So there again, the PowerPoint and the guide will both be on uh, Florida IP Day, where the uh, webinars are archived. Good questions. Other questions? Oh, and Merrill's telling me that they are already there. Science will be next week, next Wednesday, same time, same place. So please go ahead and register. I will tell you that Florida IP Day has been so thrilled with all of the response that they have added numbers. So the more the merrier. Any other questions? If not, on behalf of Susan and myself, thank you so much for being with us today. We hope to see you again next Wednesday at 3 o'clock. Um, if you have any questions, you've got both Susan's and my email. So thank you very much, and guys, have a wonderful rest of the day. Have a great one. Thanks, guys.